get this. Good morning. How are we doing today? Happy New Year. Can you believe it? It's 2022 already. I feel like I just blinked and we got through 2021 because 2020, that was a long, long year, wasn't it? And then 2021 came and I blinked and it was gone. And here we are, a new year. Amen? A new season. Happy New Year. Well, you might be wondering who I am. My name is Luke Bonslar. I actually serve as the campus director here in Detroit at Life Challenge Ministries. Uh, Life Challenge, we're actually one of your neighbors. We're right up the road uh, down Grand River over by the old Redford Theater, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, between McNichols. And, uh, and so um, we're here with Life Challenge Ministries. And who are we? We are a one-year residential recovery program for men and women who are struggling with life-controlling problems such as drug addiction or alcoholism or opioids. And, and we just believe that the only way to find true and lasting recovery is through Jesus. Amen? That's what we believe. And uh, so we are one-year residential recovery program. In fact, we are the oldest and the largest faith-based recovery program in the United States. And so our umbrella ministry is, uh, yeah, that's, you can clap to that. Our umbrella ministry is uh, commonly known as Teen Challenge. How many of you guys have heard that name before? Founded by David Wilkerson, 1958 in New York. And that was, um, uh, we have grown over the years since that movement began. Uh, there are over 225 residential recovery programs here in the United States that are Life Challenge Ministries. There's 225 of them, and then there's over 2,000 globally around the world. And so this is really uh, an epidemic that's just not local to our neighborhood. It's an epidemic that travels the globe. And so there are different programs around the United States and around the world. We just happen to own and operate three campuses. We have one here in Detroit, the Detroit Men, and we have another called Detroit Women. They're both housed out of the same community. And then we have one up in Flint, which actually we have another rally going on at this very moment over in Flint at one of their churches. And um, if Life Challenge, if we've been here before, more likely than not, my dad, Jeff Bonsalar, who is the executive director, he was probably here and we look very much alike. So that may be why some of you are scratching your head there. We're almost like twins. It's kind of scary. But here's our mission statement. Our mission statement is restoring communities by bringing faith-based recovery to the addicted. Because really, uh, addiction, it doesn't just affect one person. Did you know that? It affects the entire family unit, and uh, it affects the entire community. And so that's what we're after, to restore the community. And so we might be wondering what sets us apart. You know, first of all, we are Christ-centered. You know, uh, addiction, it's complex. Did you know that? Uh, there's not like kind of a one-shoe-fits-all to addiction. It's very uh, complex. It's muddy. Um, it's not one simple solution all the time. It, it's part neurological, part psychological, part genetics, and where those lines intersect, we don't always know per person, per se, um, but we do believe at the heart of addiction, there is a spiritual component that must be addressed. We believe that's through Jesus Christ, that, that saving knowledge and belief in Jesus. Amen. And so what sets us apart, we are a residential program. We're here for one year. It's a one-year program. We're not 14 days. We're not three months. We're not six months. And, and those type of uh, communities, those type of groups, uh, they all have their place, I believe, in the recovery world. But we just believe that sometimes you got to get out of Dodge for a spell. And so uh, we have this saying around Life Challenge, um, you don't get into addiction overnight. And actually, you don't get out of addiction overnight. And so we are a one-year residential program. It's very highly structured. And, um, and so what would we ask of you? Well, first of all, we would ask that you guys be our ambassadors for us. Um, chances are we all know somebody, actually just by a show of hands, how many of you guys know somebody who is in recovery or struggling with addiction just out of curiosity? Maybe it's a family member, a friend. Almost every single person that we go to in a church, they, they're connected to at least one. Chances are multiple people, and if you didn't raise your hand, uh, chances are 
that uh, it's actually being hidden from you. And so we all know somebody who's struggling with addiction. We would just have ask of you that you just be our ambassadors. You let people know about Life Challenge Ministries. Of course, we'd ask that you, if it, the Lord lays it on your heart, to give or to pray for us or to volunteer. But um, just out of curiosity, um, how many of you are in recovery yourself? You yourself are in recovery just by a show of hands? Okay. All right. So uh, here's the thing. The late Gerald May says there's two kinds of people. There are those in recovery, and there are those that should be, actually. So how many of you, how many of you struggle with pride every once in a while? How many of you guys struggle with anger every once in a while? Uh, gluttony, laziness, I mean, we're all there, right? We're all in recovery is the point I'm trying to make. We're all, we're all not perfect. We're all on our way. We're all in recovery. Um, we just happen to work with men and women who's, whose relapses, though I've relapsed in anger, I've relapsed in laziness, like we all have. Um, addiction is, is unique in the fact that when those relapses happen, they're often more pronounced, and they have severe effects on the individual and the family member, as you can imagine. So we've all been there, right? So we're all kind of in this together. We're all in recovery. And so actually, what I want to do before we get to the Word, I just want you to hear some of the stories the people that I work with, the people that I live with, of what they're going through and how God is meeting them exactly where they're at. And then we'll get into the word. Can we do that? Are you guys okay with that? So um, can I have Keith and Brian and Joe? You guys want to come on forward? Can you give a, a warm welcome to these individuals? So let's do this. How about Keith? Do you want to come up here with me? So how about you introduce yourself and then uh, tell uh, tell these lovely people where you're from. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm from Warren, Michigan. And uh, Keith, how long have you been here with us at Life Challenge? I've been here for 11 months. So 11 months out of a 12-month program. That's pretty amazing. And uh, we're looking forward to your graduation, not to see you leave, but obviously to see what God is going to be doing in and through you. So why don't you just go ahead and, Keith, Tell these people, rewind 11 months or so, and maybe even a little bit further back if you need be, what was going on in your life physically, emotionally, uh, maybe spiritually at that time in your life? Well, I, I struggled with alcohol in my life, but um, 11 months ago or so, I was drinking at work. Um, I was sneaking alcohol in the basement. I was, I was what you call a functional alcoholic. So I, I would drink and, and, and hide it, and I thought nobody knew, but everybody Everybody kind of knew. Um, but it came to a point where it just couldn't be hidden anymore. And it was tearing me up so bad, spiritually speaking, that I just couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah, yeah and you said uh, a functional alcoholic, and you kind of gave explanation to it. It gives you that sense that things are under control, and really they, they're not under control. No, they never really were under control. I just, it was just a perception. A misperception. Yeah. And you've got family. Um, you have how many sons? But father of five, father of five, and a grandfather of six. Okay, <clears throat> right. And so here you were, eleven months ago. You're drinking on the job, kind of trying your best to hide things. When did you kind of realize that things were starting to spiral out of control, and maybe you needed a higher level of help? Well, I've been to Life Challenge once before for the same and more issues um and i stayed for six months um upon leaving life challenge at that time i had an opioid problem when i came in plus alcohol when i left life challenge i didn't have an opioid problem anymore so when i started drinking again and it started getting out of control i knew where i needed to go and i knew i knew that i needed jesus in my life that was the only thing that was going to help yeah, and what was that, if you can recall back to a moment, I don't know if it was a situation or if it was an epiphany or maybe a conversation with a family member, but um, what was that kind of that moment where things kind of crossed the line and you said, I need to go back to Life Challenge? Um, because obviously a, a one-year commitment, that's a big deal. I mean, uh, when we tell people on the phone, when they reach out to us, we're a one-year program, you kind of get a pause on the other side of the line because that, that's a long time. Um, so what for the what for you was that moment? And that's the last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> um, 
I knew what it was about. I'd been, like I said, I'd been there before. Um, I fought it every step of the way. I mean, I had to lose my job, nearly lose my, my marriage, you know, estrange myself from my children, everything before I was willing to, uh, to come back. So I, I drove it as far as I could drive it, till the, almost till the wheels fell off. So, And for some, some individuals, it takes one time, it takes two times. Um, we're here for it. Um, uh, like I said, addiction, addiction is uh, it's messy, it's, it's complex. And um, why don't you just go ahead and update people on what's been going on? You, you haven't been here six months this time. You've been here 11 months. I guess the question would be, why did you stay, first of all, longer than six months and then What's God been doing? Well, when I first started, you know, I was here for my family. And I wasn't necessarily here for me. I was here for the wrong reasons, and I, I freely admit that. Um, most especially for my wife, she was ready to leave. Um, you know, my, my family was at stake. So I, I decided I was going to stay for three months. Right, That was my grand plan, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, my wife, God bless her, she said, no, no. You, you stay or you go, and by go, she meant go. And so, you know, I, I, I decided to stick it out. After about four months in, she more or less released me from that commitment, if you will. She said, look, it's, it's your recovery. It's between you and God. Um, if you stay, it's because you need help, not because, you know, you want to keep your marriage, this and that. So she released me. And... It was a big load off of my shoulders at that point because, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting anything out of what I was doing. And that began the process of being able to surrender and, uh, and truly get recovery. Yeah. There's that song, even when you can't see it, he's working, right? And perhaps that was part of your journey. Even when you couldn't see it day by day or month to month, now you can look back and you can see God has been doing something in your life. So you hear got a couple more weeks, um, and uh, we're looking forward to your graduation and celebrating with you. Uh, thanks for sharing. I appreciate you, Keith. All right. <clears throat> All right. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Joe Wright. I'm from Monroe, Michigan. Monroe, Michigan. And uh, how long have you been here with us, Joe? Uh, I, I didn't even hit 30 days yet. Today, today is my 30 days of sobriety off of heroin. Come on. All right. You know, uh, Joe has said some things that have really given me a good chuckle over the last 30 days. We went to a Pistons game. We had been given some free tickets. And Joe turned around and he looked at me and he said, I've never had this much fun sober before. And uh, it's just so good. Uh, tell them, you had told me in the lunchroom the other day, you had this idea or a dream of when you were 40. Do you recall what I'm talking about? So uh, in most of my life, I've been incarcerated 14 years in the penitentiary. I ain't been over to stay a day sober in there. And, uh, you know, ever since I was 28, when I first tried to get sober, and uh, I, I used to tell myself, you know, and tell everybody around me, when I'm 40, I'm going to be sober by the grace of God. And I'm turning 40 on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important part right there. <laughs> Okay, so you, you kind of told us a little bit, um, spent some time incarcerated. What kind of, you, you might need to go back a little bit. What was going on in your life that kind of brought all those issues to the forefront? Okay, so, uh, you know, my father was an alcoholic. Uh, you know, I had, uh, my mother died when I was nine years old, and she was the rock of my family. And, and, and all the heart and soul kind of left then. And I became like a father figure at the age of 10 to my little sisters. You know, Faith and Angie, one of them's dead now, but her went over those. Her birthday is tomorrow. Um, so, you know, it's like uh, I ended up losing my childhood at that point, and I got incarcerated. Actually, they wanted to incarcerate me at the age of 16, but 17, they kicked my father's doors in and come and got me because I was robbing and stealing to support my little sisters, basically. My father had a severe alcohol problem. So things were spiraling out of control at a young, young age. I mean, you said you felt this burden of responsibility as a 10-year-old. Uh, can't imagine what that felt like on your shoulders. Uh, for the next six or seven years, you felt this uh, responsibility to look out for your family, for your sisters. And so uh, just kind of uh, things started to happen. Life started to get out of control. And um, 
heroin got involved? At what point in your life was that in, in the picture? Uh, believe it or not, first place I ever done heroin was in the state penitentiary. I was nine years old. Uh, I injected it. It was on Christmas Eve, and I remember loving it because it took me away from all that darkness that I've been living for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I just thought that I found my heaven. And, and, and you know, I mean, to be sitting here today is just by the grace of God. I mean, uh, I just kind of want to say this story. Six weeks ago, I was right down the road here on Grand River, and uh, I just found out that I'm about to have a daughter. And, and, you know, a guy like me, even in happy times, I do not know how to react. So what I did, I went and got me some heroin. And, and you know, I just thought, you know, I'm fine. And did just like half the pack or whatever. I woke up three hours later in my car. I was by myself. My fingernails were black. My lips were crusted white. I had been there. And, and when I woke up, I can't explain the presence I had of, uh, like, and the only thing I can think of was I just knew that my Lord and Savior just gave me my life back. And seven days later, I was at Life Challenge. Heroin is dangerous, and um, you kind of had that moment there, um, that epiphany that uh, you need help. And um, it's just amazing to see that even over the last 30 days, kind of teaching yourself what life is and how you can enjoy life and how you can live life, kind of having to retrain, uh, restructure your kind of your own thinking in a sense. And so you've been just so uh, such a great light on our campus with the guys the last 30 days or so. But you want to just say something that's just been encouraging. What's Jesus been doing in you? So, you know, uh, I used to think the drugs and the alcohol was my problem. And the, the reality was is not having Jesus Christ in my life was my problem. And, you know, when I came this time, there was no other option. I died as Joe Wright. And, you know, now I got to read like that year process. It says in the Bible, we have to be like little children and we have to relearn all these attitudes and these walks and these thoughts and these. So, you know, but, and, and it's funny when you really surrender how God pierces your heart and it's when real surrender is there and you give it to God and you get into that word. I don't see how anything can stop you. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate you. You know, he, he said something important there that I want to just make sure we, we all got. Uh, we all have a God-sized hole in our heart, and we try to fill it with other things. And the thing is, uh, they don't work. They don't satisfy. And you were trying to fill it with heroin. You were trying to fill it with responsibility. And you just end up meeting with Jesus, and he's reteaching you or relearning how to live, and it's just amazing to see that. So thank you again. And uh, last but certainly not least, who do we have here? Hi, my name is Brian Hall. Brian Hall, where are you from? Um, originally from Muskegon, Michigan, but I actually live right now uh, at Life Challenge, but my, my permanent residence is in Detroit, uh, Joy and Schaefer, so right down the street. All right, so really a neighbor of you guys right here. I didn't know that until you told me a few minutes ago. And um, what's great about Brian, uh, Brian uh, has actually completed our restoration program, which I'm sure you could probably get into in just a moment. And he's actually serving as an intern on our men's division. So he is actually uh, part of our men's team and serving our men here. So he does a great job. He's been doing that for the last uh, about month, month and a half or so. But why don't you get into your story? Um, I, I don't know if you need any prompts, but uh, why don't you rewind for us? Okay. Um, I'll actually go back about... 10 months ago. Um, previous to that, I just have struggled with addiction since I was about 12 or so. Um, and it's been a constant, I was drawn and addicted right off the bat. And um, so I've been struggling with that. Um, about 10 months ago, I had a baby. And um, I had been clean prior to that for six years, uh, living for the Lord. And during COVID, I think things kind of got out of control. Um, you know, getting disconnected from God. And so when we had our baby, I really struggled with responsibility, um, really had a lot of fear surrounding um, the birth of a child and becoming a dad. Now, I did have a three-year-old, but this responsibility was just too much uh, for me. And so I did relapse on my six-year clean day. Um, and like I said, I wasn't really with the Lord at that point. Um, I knew that God wanted me back. Um, and so when I relapsed, I relapsed very, very hard. Um, I ended up out there for about a month and a half and spent $30,000.
So um, that's kind of what brought me into Life Challenge. I remember sitting on the corner of Joy and Warren um, by the Sky Cafe right there, um, just sitting on a park bench, and God just said, go, to, go back to Teen Challenge, go back to Life Challenge. And so I called. And go back? Yeah, go, go do a restoration program. Now, um, what you didn't share in your story, um, so Brian had spent some time with us before, Yes, I actually graduated in 2016 and uh, did an internship and worked on staff as well then. And so you kind of, you know, just uh, more recently, 10 months ago, um, just kind of saw your life going out, um, spent all this money, didn't know how to cope, didn't know what to do. You find yourself sitting on the corner wondering, what did I just do to myself? So uh, bring us to that moment where you would hit rock bottom. Yeah, rock bottom for me this time was pretty rough. Um, ended up um, getting divorced, actually, recently. Um, didn't get to see my baby for about five months. Um, all just kind of part of this addiction that just robs and steals from us. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I knew God kind of did this, grabbed me by my shirt collar and my belt loop and, and heaved me back into his arms. And that was that life challenge where I got to sit still, I got to be with him, and I really got to have the love of Christ back in my life. So, And um, you had spent three months at our Flint campus, then you did three months here in Detroit. I remember seeing you, um, just a lot of wounds, you know, and um, just kind of what was going through uh, when I saw you at least three months in. Yeah, so I, I think I was really reeling from running from my children. Um, I was reeling from um, destroying a marriage, really, um, and it was it was on me. You know, as, as hard as it is to say, uh, it was on me, and I just pushed the people away that I love so much. Um, yeah, so it was just I, that's where I kind of saw you. I was ju- I was really destroyed, and I tried to play it off as I was tough, you know, and I could handle it all. But um, Jesus had to be the one to help me handle that. Yeah, yeah for sure. And so now Brian is rebuilding his life, and what that looks like might be different than what you initially thought. Rebuilding his life uh, upon Jesus, and he's seeing what God is doing. Do you want to just encourage them with um, just something up up to date, maybe within the last couple days that you've just been sensing in your own life? Yeah, I would just encourage everybody, you know, that what we see um, right up in front of us is not the grand picture. And God has such a bigger picture for each one of us. Um, like Pastor Luke said, I'm doing this internship, and that was that's part of the big picture, and that's part of God. Um, just ha- He has so much in store for us. There's so much grace. There's so much mercy. There's just so much love, um, and the love of God. Um, I think what I've really learned is with that, we can do anything. We can go anywhere, and, you know, it says that in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you. You know, and uh, if you've ever sat in your car with the headlights on, um, you can only see about 100 yards with your headlights. Uh, and sometimes I feel like that's all that God gives us to operate in. We don't have um, a mile sometimes that we can see. Sometimes we only get 100 feet with which to operate. And it's just to be obedient with that 100 feet. And so that's what Brian is doing day by day. So I appreciate you, Brian. Well, with the, the, the few minutes that we've got left, um, I just wanted to bring you guys to a story in the Bible. Um, you know, we are in a new year, right? So 2022 here, we're in a new year. And um, if you can just kind of think back on the year that we just had, um, we had quite a year, right? It was a unique season that we were in. I mean, just think about this. We had the 2020 Olympics, but they were held in 2021. Well, that's kind of mind-boggling right there, right? Um, we had a couple things. We had President Joe Biden. He got inaugurated. Um, we've had concerts continue after a year and a half break. I mean, amen for that. Come on, somebody. There we go. We, we've had a new variant just get put out there recently. Um, uh, we've had just a lot of unique challenges in 2021. You guys feel me on that? And it's been a new season. Uh, But I just want to ask the question here on the second day of the new year. I want you to ask you, what season is God bringing me into? What season is God bringing 
me into. If you, if you think about it, maybe some of you are new parents, and that's a new season. Or, or maybe some of you guys are uh, pursuing the, the process of adoption. Perhaps some of you are starting a new job, or maybe you've made a commitment to start a new health journey, or, or maybe some of you guys are transitioning to a new school or a, a new uh, grad school or a new college. Perhaps some of you guys are starting off your recovery journey, and so this really is a new season for some of you. But my question to you is, what season is God bringing me into? In fact, uh, you know, sometimes I think there are seasons of stillness where God just asks you to stop doing so much and just be still and listen. You know, that's a season. Sometimes there's seasons of adversity where there's more challenges that are brought into our life. Maybe there's a health thing or a financial thing and it's an adversity and God is trying to bring you into that season to bring you out of it. We're all walking through a new season. But check this out. There's this amazing new season verse in the book of Isaiah chapter 43. This is what God says through the prophet Isaiah, one of my favorite scriptures. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present because I'm about to do something brand new. God is about to do something brand new. And, and it's so appropriate, I think, to say that here at the very onset of this brand new year, God is about to do something brand new. So be alert, be present, and be on the lookout. But there's a problem with that. Because as exciting as a new season can be, not everyone likes new. Not everyone likes change. Change means risk. Change means unknown, and we can be a little hesitant about making changes. And so as you navigate the different seasons that God is bringing you into, we all have a choice to make. You have two options. You can either step forward into growth, or you can step back into safety. There's a great Martin Luther King Jr. quote. He says, you don't have to see the entire staircase. You just got to take the first step. And so my encouragement for you guys, no matter where you're at, no matter what season God is bringing you into, you don't need to see the entire staircase. Like Brian said, you don't need to see the entire picture. You just need to take the first step from wherever you're at this morning. And so here's what I want to do. I actually want to take you to a new season book of the Old Testament. Did you know that? There's a new season book in the Old Testament. It's it's for the children of Israel. And this new season book is called Joshua. So if you turn to Joshua chapter 5, Joshua, Joshua really is a new season book. Here's why. A couple reasons. Well, there's new leadership. It's no longer Moses that's leading the children of Israel. Now it's a guy named Joshua who the book is named after. And there's actually a new body of water. They're not talking about the Red Sea anymore. Now they're talking about the Jordan River that God had just parted. There's actually a new location. No longer are they wandering around in the desert on sand. Now they've got dirt as they're walking into the promised land. And there's even a new posture. They're no longer wanderers and strangers, but now they've become fighters as they're looking to claim the promised land, the land that God had promised to them. And I just want you guys to listen carefully. Because not only is there new leadership, there's a new body of water, there's a new posture, but God was actually giving them a new diet for this new season. And that sounds a little silly when I say it, but God was about to do something that he hadn't done in 39 long years. Do you know what happened? It kind of tells us back in, in Exodus 16 that when they were in the desert, God would actually provide for them through this food called manna. It was like pita bread that would rain down from the sky. And it did this six days out of the week for 39 long years. Can you imagine what that would be like? How many of you guys have seen that cartoon movie, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? You ever seen that? And, and there's like on the front logo of that DVD cover, there's a guy, he's looking, there's like a meatball flying out and there's spaghetti and there's pizza. It's a really strange movie in the concept, but that's kind of what was happening back here in this time. There was bread literally raining down from the sky. So imagine that you're in your bed and you're getting your morning coffee and then a pita bread lands on your front door. That'd be insane, right? 
And that's what was happening every day for 39 years. But this is what's crazy. Because something happens when they cross the Jordan River and they celebrate the Passover, something happens. I want to take you there. Joshua chapter 5. Let's read it together. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped. It stopped. It ceased the day after they ate this food from the land. I want us to recognize that for a second because there's going to be moments in your life where God is trying to bring you into a new season. He's getting ready to, but the problem is you're carrying too much stuff. You've got too many suitcases. You've got too much manna, too much baggage. And so some of that stuff needs to be taken away. Here's a point for you, or if you're writing down a note, whenever it's time to move into a season, I think more often than not, it's time to remove something as well. Whenever it's time to move, it's also a time to remove. This is especially relevant and true for recovery. Whenever it's time to move into a season where you make that decision, where I'm trying to get my life figured I'm trying to get it straight. I'm trying to go into recovery. More often than not, God starts by removing something, whether it was a relationship or a job or a sense of security or a sense of independence. Isn't that true? When, when it's time to move, it's also time to remove. You guys know this is true. I mean, I just went, I, I moved into a new house just recently. In fact, Keith actually helped me move into it. Well, when we were packing up our old house, um, we were moving things, and we were packing them into, uh, into boxes, and I started to notice all these things that didn't need to come with me. You ever had that drawer in your kitchen? It's the catch-all drawer, and you open it up, and you're like, what happened here? And you always shove it, and you push it shut whenever there's uh, visitors over because you don't want people to see that drawer. Whenever it's time to move, it's time to remove some things that aren't meant or intended to go on the journey next with you. Because when it's time to move, it's time to remove some things. And perhaps God is moving all of us into a new season, or perhaps you're in the process of that. God might just start your journey by taking certain things away. This is especially true in recovery. He might take away a relationship might take away some finances, might take away a certain opportunity. There might be some health challenges that you face. There might be some different obstacles that are put into your path because you had things taken away from you. And the problem is when God starts to do this and he starts to move things around in your life, he starts taking things that you want or things you think you need And God is going, hey, that stuff can't go with you to the next season, so I've got to move it out. Because in order for me to do what I want to do, that stuff can't go with you. I've got to lighten the load. In fact, uh, just a personal story, um, when we, 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 my wife and I, this is my wife, Deonza, we just transitioned to be campus directors at Life Challenge just um, about 10 months ago. Uh, previous to that, I was serving as a pastor uh, at a local congregation for about six years when I began the sense that God was doing something new in me. And at the time, I didn't quite know what that was, but I had a moment like Gideon where he sets out the fleece. And so I put my house up for sale and I said, God, if I'm really hearing from you and I don't know what the next step is, then I'm going to put the house on the market. I'm just going to see what you do. Well, the house sold before it ever even hit the market. And I didn't have a job. I didn't have any place to stay. Uh, I'm still fairly new in my marriage. I'm thinking, what did I just do? How do I explain this to her parents now? Crazy. And um, we moved back into my parents' house, which was a humbling thing of its own. And for the next three to five months, was just trying to figure out, what are you doing with me, God? Because I thought I heard from you. Now this thing happened, and you removed a house from me and kind of removed some of my pride at the same time and my sense of providing or the sense of that role that I can do for my wife. And now I'm, I'm all confused and what's going on. 
Eventually, you know, we ended up taking the job here at Life Challenge because God made that abundantly clear. But when it was time to move into a new season, God had to take away some things for me because they couldn't come with me. He needed to lighten the load. So always remember that. Whenever it's time to move, more often than not, it's first time to remove something. And here's what happens. Because God was going to do this in the lives of the children of Israel. He was taking away the manna, but he was going to teach them something through that and actually provide something else for them. Because I think there's something to be learned when the manna stops. Because when God removed it, he was trying to take them into a brand new season. And here's the first thing, if you're writing down notes, I think that in Joshua chapter 5, 11, it says that very day they ate some of the produce of the land. That very day. You know, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been on your work commute, sometimes you see things every day and you don't quite see them clearly. There are some times when I'm driving into work and I blink, and I'm at work. I'm like, how did I just get here? I know I got in the car. I know I had to make a couple lefts and a right, and I had to stop at some stoplights, but that's weird. I'm here. It's because sometimes when you do something on a routine, you do some things every day, you start to stop seeing things all around you. And I think that's what was beginning to happen because for 39 years, manna rained down from the sky. Day one, that's insane. That's insane. Day two, you still don't know what to say because it's still happening. You're like, how did this get here? Two weeks later, I'm sure you're still talking about it. Three months later, four months later, it's normal. It's just part of the routine. Yeah, man, it rains down from the sky. It rains down six days a week. It just happens. It's in the forecast. And you stop seeing it for what it truly is. And I think that sometimes God will do this in our lives. He'll make the manna stop so that you can have a new discovery. What do I mean by that? You start to see more of God in things than you had before. A new discovery. You start seeing more of God. Because all of a sudden, you've got the Israelites. They're noticing the food around them. We just saw that in Joshua. They're like, hold up. This green stuff is edible? We can eat this? We don't have to eat bread all the time? You can plant these seeds in the ground right here, and it will grow, and we can eat that. <laughs> when God moved them into a new season, he might take some things away from you that forces you to see God in places that you hadn't seen him before. I've seen that in my own life when God has taken things away, whether it be a relationship or a job or my sense of security. Sometimes God does that so that you can see him a little bit better. Here's what's so cool, though. Once you start making new discoveries, God will start moving into this new thing. And this is the hard one for a lot of people. He'll start giving you new depth. You start to see gains where other people saw loss. You start to see God gains, but other people see the L. I mean, think about this. Okay, so for the last 39 years, you've been getting a, a nice supply of food every day. There could have been some Israelites who were out there complaining, thinking to themselves, what good is there when the manna stops? You just took away our 39-year-old hit item off the menu. I mean, this was the hit. We ate it every day. How can there possibly be a gain in that? But it's amazing how you can see a gain where other people see loss. I mean, just think about this. There are some people that you've come across or maybe you yourself are one of them, where they kind of have this line of thinking, well, if I get married, then I lose my freedom, right? I lose my independence. Or if I have children, then I can lose part of my finances and my flexibility of my schedule. But let's just be honest, the gain that comes from having children or the gain that comes from having a companion in your life, or maybe some people, um, when they're thinking about life challenge, they can see that as a loss of a year, I got to give away a year of my life. But think about it. True maturity is when we see the gains where other people see loss. To think, I can give a year of my life to get things in order so that the rest of my life doesn't have to follow the same pattern that it's been on. You start to see gains where other people see losses. So God takes away the manna, 
from the Israelites, what's the gain? Because that's what I would be asking. Well, they lost manna, but I wrote down a couple for you. But now they get produce from the land. Now they get a variety of food. They don't just have to eat the same thing every single day. They started to gain a work ethic that they hadn't had before because they have to go out into the field and they actually have to harvest the crops. They're gaining agricultural skill, things that they didn't have while they were living in the desert. They're gaining new disciplines because they got to start waking up early and they got to start working the field. They're gaining a gratefulness for their health because they're moving from place to place and they're working hard. They're gaining a new dependency on God because they had to trust him when the rain didn't come that God is still going to bring us through this season. Think about that. There's always God gains whenever we experience a loss. We just don't always see those initially. And in fact, we can't always forecast when they're going to come. But remember this. Whenever God removes, he always replaces. That's the good news. Whenever God removes something in your life or someone in your life, he always replaces. And if anybody knows this principle to be true, it would be the apostle Paul. Think about this guy. Paul has been beaten, imprisoned, flogged, shipwrecked. He lost his high-paying job. He was abandoned by his friends. He lost his health on numerous occasions. His reputation was damaged. His intentions were misinterpreted. And do you remember what he lost before God brought him into a new season at the very forefront of his story? He even lost his sight before God replaced it. This is what the Apostle Paul says about all of that. Philippians chapter 3. We read it earlier this morning. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Think about how incredible that is. He's saying, you know what? I got something from that season that God brought me through time and time again. I, I couldn't have learned this from a book or a podcast or a seminar. God took something. But whenever God removes something, he always replaces. And God put back things into my life. And the gain was better than what I had to begin with. And now Paul, when he's writing this, now he realizes Whatever I had lost meant nothing because I gained something so much greater. I know that Christ is mine and Christ can be found in me. Amen? So let me wrap it up. God is moving all of us into a new season. For our men here on Life Challenge, he is moving you into a new season. Or maybe some of you guys are in the process of that. Remember, Whenever it's time to move, more often than not, it's time to remove something. And God might start taking things away from you that will only weigh you down on the journey. What do you do? Listen to these words from a Holocaust survivor, Corey Ten Boom. This is what she says. She wrote a, a, an amazing book, The Hiding Place. Quote, I've learned to hold everything loosely. That way it doesn't hurt when God takes them from me. Instead of gripping onto things tightly and saying, God, I need this, or I need that, or I need them, hold on to things loosely as God get ready to move you into a new season because when he removes, he always replaces. More often than not, it's better than what you would have had to begin with. You know, there's a great, Methodist preacher from the 19th century. His name is William Stankster. He has these journals that he would write in about the different experiences that he had in his pastoral ministry. And there's an amazing encounter that he has with a young teenage girl. He visits her in the hospital because the doctors were going to say, she just got cancer and we have to do surgery on you for, in order for this to stop spreading. And they didn't have all the knowledge that we have now. And they believed that they would actually have to take away this young girl's eyes away from her to stop the spread. And so he's about to have this encounter with this teenage girl in the hospital who's just been uh, diagnosed with cancer. She's just found out 
that she's going to be blind. And here's the conversation that he writes about in the journal. Quote, God is going to take my sight away, the little girl said. William responded by saying, Jesse, don't let him take it. Instead, just give it to him. Just give it to him. And watch what God does with that handicap. Watch what God does, does as a new season begins to happen. Because always remember, new seasons have new discovery and new depth. Replacement for what God has taken, God will always come through for us. The Israelites found that out in the story. Jesse, in that story I just read to you, she found that. I found that to be true in my own life. God will always lead us through a new season. Amen. So as we begin this new year, I just wanted to bring some encouragement to you. This principle is especially true in recovery. And I think most of our guys know that because we've experienced those moments where we hit rock bottom and God had to take some things or probably several things away from us for us to have a realization. But God will always replace those things. That's the good news. And he replaces it more often than not with his presence and perhaps he attaches other things along with that. But that's the encouragement for each and every one of us. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, we're just thankful that you have brought us through the past year and you've brought us to this new day. The first Sunday of 2022, as we look forward to many of the things that you're going to be doing. And God, sometimes you might already be in the process of doing a new thing in us right now. Perhaps some of us aren't privy to that. But Lord, would you help us to be alert and to be present and to be on the lookout for whatever you're going to be doing. And there might be those moments like the Israelites had where you start by taking away some of those routines. You take away some of the things that we could count on that were reliable week in, week out. But you need to move us into a new place. And so, Lord, you want us to have that new dependence on you, that new discovery of who you are where we see more of you in places that we hadn't seen you before. So God, help us to surrender, like Corey Ten Boom says, to hold everything loosely so that way we can just give it to you. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen.